Michael Hartnett is the Chief Investment Strategist at Merrill Lynch. Amongst all Merrill's economists and strategists, he's probably the best known amongst institutional and retail investors. It's a big title, and he's followed by hundreds of thousands of advisors and millions of investors. He's been around the block for a few decades, and he's seen a few economic and stock cycles. He predominantly uses a data-driven approach. While too conservative for his second half 2021 outlook, he was one of the first sell-side strategists to correctly call for a first half 2022 sell-off for what turned out to be the right reason. That reason, higher inflation and slowing growth. This is also known as stagflation in economic circles. Almost a week and a half ago, late Monday night, early Tuesday morning on July 19th, Michael Hartnett released his much anticipated global fund manager survey. Its title in bold headlines, it read, I'm so bearish, I'm bullish. The first sentence of his report read as follows. The full capitulation. July's fund manager survey shows a dire level of investor pessimism. Expectations for global growth and profits are at all time lows. Cash levels are highest since the 9-11 terrorist attack and equity allocations lowest since the Lehman Brothers collapse. Our bull bear indicator remains a max bearish level zero, but sentiment is saying stocks and credits should rally. And with that headline and with those words, after grinding higher since June 16th, Tuesday at the open, the markets exploded upward in both price volume and market breadth as measured by advanced decline stocks. I'm Chris Paris with Oak Harvest Financial Group here in Houston, Texas, and welcome to our weekly Stock Talk podcast. Before we get into this week's topic, dissecting Mr. Hartnett's market call for a rally, which is a follow-up to our July 1st video, Opportunity Knocks Early, and July 8th follow-on, Opportunity Knocks Part 2 videos, please take a moment to click on the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you'll be alerted when our team uploads our latest content. You'll find the links to those two videos down below in the description. This is going to be a chart-laden episode because as frequent viewers know, the investment team at Oak Harvest tries to use data over emotions. We'll repurpose a few charts from the Opportunity Knox episodes, but most will come from news sources. If you want another similar summary of bullish case for the markets, you'll find a link to Jim Cramer's July 19th episode reviewing Larry Williams' charts in the description below. We discussed Mr. Williams' work in prior videos. First, professional speculators, investment positioning, which is a contrary indicator, is now contrarian bullish. We gave you this chart on July 1st. Here it is again. The CFTC, S&P 500 futures positioning, is at a low. It's as low as it was in the 2016 and 2011 market bottoms. The market's subsequent upward moves lasted months and quarters, not just days and weeks. Remember though, they were not straight lines. Another positive yet contrarian bullish institutional position is their cash holdings. Cash levels have now risen to about 6.1% from under 4% last November when the markets topped out. That's the highest level since October 2001. Here's that chart from Merrill Lynch. Yes, 6.1% doesn't sound like a lot of cash to most people. However, you must remember that most of these institutional money managers, their performance is being compared against the S&P 500 index return. The S&P 500 index carries no cash, zero, none, nada, nothing, ever. Vanguard and BlackRock, S&P 500 index, ETFs, and mutual funds' sole goal is to mimic the daily performance of the S&P 500 regardless of whether it is up or down. Each day, every day, and the only way they do that is being 100% invested every day regardless of inflows or outflows. So when the markets start to reverse course higher, these other active managers carrying 6% cash will almost always lag the market's overall returns. Guess who doesn't like that? Marketing and sales departments who sell only investment performance, not comprehensive financial planning, tax planning, or hands-on retirement planning. Our investment team talks a lot about sentiment and emotions in the market. We talk a lot about how one should try to distance themselves from making decisions based on feelings and pure emotions. Instead, we try to find and track measurable data 
on investor sentiment that leads market moves and investor behaviors. Here's an interesting chart, again, from Merrill Lynch that gauges whether investors are taking more or less risk than normal in their portfolios and investments. As you can see from the chart, 58% of investors are currently taking below normal risk. That's a level below max negativity and positioning during the great financial crisis in Lehman Brothers moment. Does that make sense given where we are in the economy and employment cycle? Given where individuals and banks balance sheets stand? It doesn't to our team. On Tuesday, July 19th, breadth in the market exploded upward. So much so that a few brave souls declared the bear market is over. The advanced decline of the broad NYSE was up 14 to one after an eight to one reading the prior Friday which was option expiration for July. Data on the S&P 500 was equally as broad with 495 stocks up and 10 down for the broadest breadth since December 26, Christmas rally in 2018, which started and lasted almost four months. Both the S&P 500 and tech heavy NASDAQ reclaimed their 50 day moving averages, which is a start at repairing the damage to the technical charts that people like to see. According to market research from Sentiment Trader, there have only been 13 times in the modern era that the S&P 500 up volume was 87% or more for two out of three trading days coming off a 52 week low. In all 13 cases, 100% of the time, the S&P 500 was higher a year later with a median return of 23%. I like those odds and I like those returns given what our early July work was saying. Here's a similar table from Merrill Lynch that shows that returns following 90% up days on the NYSC. This is a shorter term data set that traders might like, but it also shows the same trend. The week immediately after these events tend to be muted as the market digests the gains. However, looking out three months of trading, the S&P 500 has been positive 80% of the time with the median return of about eight and a half percent. History tells us that stocks do a lot of repricing work in front of recessions because stocks anticipate slowdowns. They anticipate peak revenue growth. They anticipate peak margins. They anticipate are things as good as they get? Is the peak or marginal return on cash right now? Likewise, stocks anticipate troughs in fundamentals and troughs in economic momentum. They bottom in front of the worst data, usually by months not by hours, days, or weeks. If you look at a recessionary contraction as the worst economic data we can have in the market, here's Ben Carlson's work on what happened to the stock markets before, during, and after every recession since World War II. It's the data-driven historical evidence showing investors that stocks and markets anticipate inflection points, both good and bad. It should tell an investor, if you wait to see the whites of their eyes, you'll be late to action. On July 1st, we published this 30 year chart on the NASDAQ and ask this question. Is it time to dump technology stocks? Or would it be better to add some back? The relative performance of the NASDAQ composite had just touched its 20 year trend line. The index had found support on its 50 month moving average for only the 10th time in 20 years. We asked, are you gonna be a buyer or seller of growth and tech stocks down here? Since that day, the S&P 500 is up about 3%, and the NASDAQ is up over double that at around 6.6%. But to me as an investor, not a trader, the question to me is now what? Do I panic as an investor or do I try to look forward and think about where the economy and markets will be in six to 12 months from now, given valuations are much lower and the masses are finally talking about an economic slowdown or a recession. Do you skate to where the puck was or do you try to skate to where the puck is likely going to be in the first half of 2023? In our upcoming videos, we will share more of our thoughts on the second half of 2022 and the first half of 2023. As we do, remember, the market cares about the margin. It cares about acceleration and deceleration as much, if not more, than velocity. Are things going to get marginally better or worse? Are shipping costs increasing or decreasing? Are labor costs accelerating or decelerating? And whether we like it or not, socially or as individuals, the stock market has historically liked boring. It likes slow, sustainable growth. It has rewarded cautious spending and hiring by management teams 
because in that environment, you, the shareholder, is rewarded with higher incremental percentage of each revenue dollar the company earns. While volatility looks like it's starting to plateau, and behind the scenes, the tea leaves are starting to say for the first time since late 2021 that the big institutional money by the dip crowd are looking to return in the upcoming months, our investment team still does not see an immediate plunge coming in market volatility. We do not see a V bottom in stocks either. So while, as we've shown the last few weeks, many of the clouds are beginning to dissipate for investors, expect a few more months of market anxiety. Many chartists and technicians have 4,100 as the level of the S&P 500 that is tough sledding to get through. We too are watching that level on a monthly basis. On the NASDAQ composite, the interesting level to our team looks like 12,900. Should the market have monthly closes above these levels, 4,100 on the S&P 500 and 12,900 on the NASDAQ, over the next few months, there's a good chance that FOMO, fear of missing out crowd, will resurface for the fourth quarter of 2022 and the first half of 2023. Behind the scenes, there are already quite a few signs that they already have. Our team here at Oak Harvest knows that the first half of 2022 has been a trying time for those in the equity and bond markets who are not trading oriented. The Oak Harvest team knows that sharp market moves drive emotions and the urge to make changes to what are supposed to be longer term asset allocations that you worked through with your advisor. If the ongoing market volatility is making you feel uneasy, give us a call and schedule a meeting with an Oak Harvest advisor. Our team does have insurance-based tools that don't have the volatility of public markets. However, viewers, I remind you that these investments may also lower your long-term expected returns. At Oak Harvest, we think our clients are best served by us helping them plan for their future needs instead of focusing on the past. The future in stock markets are always uncertain. And that is why our retirement planning team plans for your retirement needs first and your greed second. Give us a call here to speak to an advisor and let us help you craft a financial plan that helps you meet your retirement goals. Call us here in Houston at 877-896-0040 and schedule an advisor consultation. We are here to help you on your financial journey into and through your retirement years. I'm Chris Paris, and from the whole team here at Oak Harvest, have a blessed weekend.